The Lem proposal was amazingly short. This was a 110-page document where Grumman proposed the entire LEM program, which is a $6.9 billion program. And that's an outrageously small document for anyone to submit and ask for $6.9 billion. There's no way that a reviewer could determine whether or not the contractor is going to accomplish anything worthwhile based on 110 pages of, of documentation for that size program. When I checked into uh, 10 other programs of similar size, like the C-5A and large submarine orders or, or uh, aircraft carrier orders, this type of thing, all of the proposals were between 5,000 pages and 86,000 pages, with an average of 38,000 pages. And yet we see this one standing there all by itself at 110 pages. And it appeared to be, to me, that this may have been a situation where they knew that if anyone checked, they would, someone would say, well, in order to win this, you had to submit a proposal, right? So let me see the proposal. So they had to produce a proposal, but they didn't go to the trouble of producing one of decent length. A 110-page proposal is about appropriate for a $1.4 million program, which is 5,000 times smaller than the claimed LEM program. Now you wouldn't need a very much a very long proposal if you weren't really going to build a lem that really had to work. If you were going to be building lems that ended up in museums or on displays, then you could probably uh, do that for a few million dollars, and that might only require a 110-page proposal. If these moon landing images were faked, then how did we manage to acquire so many rocks? Core samples and lunar dust have been obtained by unmanned probes. The Soviets were particularly advanced in this technology, but there were supposedly many samples loaded onto LEMS and returned to Earth. The claim is that the Apollo program uh, collected uh, hundreds of pounds of lunar rocks, something like 750 pounds, some large amount of, of, of lunar rocks in the six missions. And I think that uh, only a few pounds were actually collected remotely by ourselves and in a similar manner by the Russians because we had an agreement before we went to the moon to trade lunar soil samples. We would trade soil from the sites that we visited and they would trade samples from the sites that their robot craft visited and compare them. And then I think the vast majority of the hundreds of pounds of moon rocks that we claim to have are made here on Earth and that's why they look so similar to Earth rocks. That's why they found that the composition is so similar. They can be irradiated or exposed to a vacuum or uh, modified in certain minor ways so that they appear slightly different. And then they uh, do an analysis and say, well, it's just like earth rocks except for these few minor changes. And then they hypothesize that they were blasted by meteorites. Well, they can be blasted by meteorites artificially. If the Saturn V was such a good launch vehicle, why was it dropped after the last Apollo mission to be replaced by the space shuttle? Why was a new launcher required when NASA supposedly had a tried and tested powerful rocket in the form of the Saturn V? The shuttle weighs about three quarters as much as the Saturn V, and it only puts about one sixth as much weight into orbit, and it costs about three times as much as the uh, Saturn V to launch. It was flown, first flown, two years behind schedule, and it's cost a lot more than the Saturn V to develop. So in almost every measure of, of rocket technology, the shuttle is greatly inferior to the claimed performance of the Saturn V. Saturn V had worked, far and away the most logical thing to do with that hardware that was developed with billions and billions of dollars was to begin producing them because then the development cost gets amortized over the cost of all of the produced vehicles 
and use it to launch the shuttle. If they wanted to actually have a, uh, an airplane that goes into orbit, they could have put a shuttle orbiter on top of the second stage of the Saturn V and flown the, the whole thing into orbit. The first stage would have dropped into the ocean like it normally does, and the second stage and the uh, fully loaded shuttle orbiter would have made, uh, made it into low Earth orbit. Now those um, second stages could have been assembled in orbit to form a space station. We could have had the first launch of uh, the shuttle about five years sooner at a savings of about $20 billion. And by the time the shuttle was actually launched in 1981, we could have had the beginnings of a manned space station in orbit. If in fact they were, their claimed performance was a hoax, then there's no reason to continue making any more of them. And that's why you might want to start all over and develop something from scratch that is actually going to work, even if it only puts up one-sixth as much payload and costs three times as much per launch. Was there ever really a space race in the true sense of the word? If we were racing the Russians to the moon, and if we beat them, uh, why didn't they do it the next year, or five years later, or ten years later, or even 25 years later? Why didn't they ever do it? And usually the response is, well, they got so discouraged because we beat them to the moon that they gave up. Well, if that were true, then why didn't we give up when they beat us with the first satellite into orbit, or the first man, or the first woman, or the first space station? Why did we keep struggling with them the whole time, and why the very first time we beat them in something major did they give up? And why did they give up so thoroughly that they never went at all? In the 1960s, there is no doubt that those who were in control of space were controlling the information that encircled the planet. So how did they manage to overcome the technical problems inherent in pulling off the faking of the live TV coverage of Apollo? I think probably the most logical way would be to beam signals to the moon and have a amplifier and repeater on the moon that would then amplify and repeat these signals and beam them back. That way anyone who had a proper antenna pointed at the moon could plainly see that they were getting signals from the moon. They just wouldn't know that those signals were, were bouncing back. One craft could have performed all of the functions that would simulate the lunar lander. It could land on the moon uh, with, its, with its repeater. Um, and this craft could also uh, place a transmitting seismometer into the lunar soil that could continue to transmit back lunar quakes, which we received for quite some time. This same device could also uh, pop out a, um, a laser reflector onto the moon's surface, and it could uh, perform all of these functions. It could also have lowered a drill into the lunar soil and dug up lunar soil, and then the return craft, unmanned, could bring that soil back uh, to Earth. What was the prognosis for manned space travel beyond low Earth orbit after the days of Apollo? The RIDE report goes a long way to answering that question. This report was written by a team that was chaired by Sally Ride, former shuttle astronaut, and uh, they speculated in this report that if NASA were fully funded on a, on a uh, mission to send men back to the moon, that they could, if they spent billions of dollars a year starting in 1987, that they would be able to, they estimated they'd be able to first land men on the moon by the year 2010, which would mean 23 years to land men on the moon for the uh, next time. And the question being, uh, since it only took, supposedly took eight years from Kennedy's announcement until Apollo 11, why would it take so much longer and cost so much more money to do it for the seventh time than it did to do it for the first six times. 